for our, our honorary staff president. And you were in Dublin, Liam, recently, sorry? You were in Dublin? I was, yeah. I was over there for the Soccer Riders Awards. Uh, and uh, I saw a few old faces I haven't seen before, and they, they actually gave me an award. They used to hate me when I was a player, but they actually gave me an award. Um, it was great to see a few old faces. I saw Paddy Mulligan. I think he's been guest here, Paddy. Uh, Paddy's in his 80s now. Uh, played for Chelsea, of course. Brought up in the League of Ireland, and uh, I think the League of Ireland has gone well this uh, th this last couple of years. It was 43,000 for the FAI Cup final, um, so I think it's on the up, and let's hope it's going to produce some players for the Republic of Ireland team in the years to come. Because in my day, you had uh, the likes of Paddy Mulligan. Uh, Mick Martin came from Bowles, Paddy was at Shamrock Rovers, uh, Jerry Daly, Bowles to Dar Man United, Derby County, and Jerry Ryan, who was a great friend of mine, who we lost a couple of months ago, he went to Derby County as well from Bowles and uh, ended up playing at Brighton. So, uh, League of Ireland's on the up, which was good to know, and uh, yeah, I had a very, very nice weekend in Dublin. Nice fun. And you obviously start the St. Kevin's Boys, which is a club close to our hearts at West London. We've supported them. Um, you met someone recently, Evan Ferguson? I did. I met Evan at the, at the uh, match between Arsenal and Brighton last year at, uh, at uh, the Emirates. And Evan, uh, Evan uh, is from St. Kevin's. And he's definitely our... Um, most promising talent, uh, I think. I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing with anyone when they, nobody will argue with me when I say that, but uh, I actually played with his grandfather and on that photograph there, the gentleman on my right is Fergus Ferguson, who's Evan's grandfather, and we played together at St. Kevin's. So it was a very nostalgic evening. Evan was up for Young Player of the Year. He didn't get it. Arsenal player got it, who I think deserved it. A fella called Saka is not too bad. <laughs> uh, but we had a nice evening together, and uh, he's actually going to come to dinner at my house one night because he lives in Hove and so do I. So I'd like to get to know the boy, and uh, I think he's going to be he's going to be a big player for Ireland in the years to come. And of course, with your links with Arsenal, with developing young players, you'll be able to give him some very sound advice, I'm sure. Well, I would say to him, most of all, if anybody comes in for you and Brighton are letting you go, come to Arsenal, that's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Not the answer I was wanting to hear at all, to be honest. But, uh, but just go back to your early days then in Dublin, growing up, loving football, playing football. We've got a number of London GAA people in here this evening. Great to have you here. Um, but tell us about the problems you encountered well, I didn't have any problems really, apart from a uh, uh, head brother at, uh, at my Christian brother school, St. Aidan's. Uh, I was a very good Gaelic player, uh, and I played left, left half forward, and we had a very good team. And we were going to play a match against a team from Galway, and I think the brothers were, must have had a bet that they were going to beat the team from Galway. Because when I went in to tell the brother I wouldn't be there, I was actually going to captain Irish schoolboys in, in uh, Real in North Wales. The brother wasn't very happy and he said, well, if you choose to play for Ireland soccer over the school, don't come back. And he meant it. And I was upset, but I chose to go to Wales, play for Ireland. And I came back uh, probably on the Sunday, I think we played on the Saturday. And on the Monday I said, Dad, I'm not going up to... He said, I'll go up. So he went up and the brother said to him, your boy is expelled. And that was it. That was... Uh, uh, that, that wasn't the nice part of Ireland at the time. There was a thing called the ban. I'm sure the, all, the, all the people uh, of my age and older uh, will remember that um, the, the powers that be in the GAA and in the, in the Christian Brothers didn't want lads playing soccer and Gaelic. You know, they wanted them to concentrate on the Gaelic. That ended 
in and around that time, I think in about 71 and 72, it ended. Uh, so uh, St. Aidan's now have a super soccer team, which I'm pleased to say. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and so just to bring you on to your move to England, then you're obviously a highly promising player in Ireland. How did that come about? Well, it came about because uh, um, I, I thought I was actually going to Manchester United because I was a Man United fan. Uh, <laughs> Look at me there, I've that got a Man United there. shirt on. Uh, but I was brought up in the, in the early 60s with Georgie Best, Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law, uh, great players. And of course, uh, Manchester United always had a strong association with Ireland. You know, we had in that uh, team that won the European Cup in 68, we had uh, Tony Dunn and Shea Brennan. Uh, and Georgie Best, uh, obviously from Northern Ireland. Um, Johnny Giles had played for them when he was a, a young lad. He played in the 63 Cup Final. So there was always a big association between uh, Ireland and, um, and, and Manchester United. So I was a Manchester United fan, but the, the scout at Manchester United was, was forever telling me that he was going to take me. But I was small, so... I think, I think he thought he didn't want to send me over too early because I might not do myself justice. But um, an Arsenal scout appeared uh, over from, from England. Uh, there was a guy in Arsenal called Bill, uh, a guy in Dublin called Bill Darby. He wrote a letter to Arsenal saying, look, you know, there's lots of good Irish players here, especially in Dublin, that the Manchester United have just got a free run. You know, they just take them and they go, and if they like them, they keep them. He said, do you need to have a scout over here? And it resonated with the chief scout at Arsenal, and he sent uh, a, a, a scout from North Wales over, and when he came over, he said to Bill Darby, who's the gentleman that wrote the letter, he said, take me to the, to, take me to the best game in, in, in this morning, on, on, a, on a Sunday morning. And he took him to a St. Kevin's game, which I was playing in. And the Welsh scout said, oh, I like the little fella. And they went around to my mother and knocked on the door, because I only lived around the corner from the park I was playing in. And they said, we'd like to take your son to Arsenal. And, uh, and that's how it happened. And they beat Manchester United to the, to the draw, you know? So I actually have, I had brothers here uh, I, was, uh, I was the youngest in my family uh, of seven. Uh, I was born 20 years after my eldest brother and 19 years after my second eldest brother. Uh, and they both played for Queen's Park Rangers and Millwall. Uh, so you can say I was born an extra time, I think. Uh, and when I came to Arsenal, they were living, they hadn't gone home. Like many people here in the room, they came here thinking, I'll come here for a year or two, and now you're all still here, aren't you? Just like me. And uh, uh, my brothers stayed here, and of course, when I went to Arsenal and they wanted me, I had the comfort of having brothers, albeit on the south of the river. Uh, they were there for me, so um, Manchester United weren't very happy, and uh, the scout went around to my mother and said, please don't let him go to Arsenal. I'll give you a washing machine if you don't have one. <laughs> and she said to me, Liam, what are we going to do? I can get a washing machine. <laughs> I said, don't worry, mother, I'll look after you. <laughs> Brilliant. So there you are with the lads. Yeah, that was uh, that's young a great picture. London. That was in the Garden of Rem Remembrance. Uh, I'm 17, Stapleton 16. O'Leary and Murphy are 15. Now the lad on the far left is Johnny Murphy. He hated, he hated England, he hated London. He couldn't wait, he was from Bray, he couldn't wait to get back. Um, and he became a very fine rugby player. He played nearly 20 times for Ireland at rugby. He was a flying machine, he was down the wing. Um, that's a great photo, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. And then you too find- sure, I'm not too sure about the gear, but there you go. <laughs> All the hairstyles, I'd say, as well, Jesus. Um, were you homesick as well in London at that time? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. First Christmas was difficult. You know, I went home for Christmas and I said to Arsenal, I don't want to come home, I don't want to come go, go back, I want to stay here. 
and they were very good. They said, look, you know, they must have known that people or kids, especially kids living away from home, are going to get homesick. And they said, just take your time. And after a couple of weeks, uh, I was, you know, I was bored, to be quite honest, and I missed my football. And when I came back uh, a few weeks after that Christmas, I really settled in and knuckled down and, uh, and became determined to get myself a professional contract. And who were your coaches then working with you at Arsenal? Uh, there was a, a, a Scots fella called Ian Crawford who was very, very regimental. Uh, uh, he, he wouldn't let us grow our hair long. Um, we wanted it like Charlie George and Georgie Best, but he thought that was out of, out of, uh, out of sync with how a footballer should, uh, should look. Um, good, better, best, I shall never rest till my good is better and my better best. That's what he used to say to us every single fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> and then your debut then, how long did it take you to get from reserves into that debut kind of team? Uh, I signed pro when I turned uh, um, uh, 17 at, uh, in February 1973, and I got my debut in October 73, so I was about 17 and a half when I played for Arsenal. Yeah. And I will just stop you there. We have a match programme from that very game, which well. is a bit of quality. We've actually got one framed here, just to the left of me, which will hopefully open up later on, get Liam to sign. That'll be another brilliant raffle prize, I think, because... I'm mad into my sports memorabilia, so we've also got that. But I don't know if you've got that yourself, have you? No, I haven't. No. Well, if you want that, we might let you have it. OK. <laughs> uh, how much? <laughs> well, we'll have to take, well, I won't go for the price it was then. Can't even see what the price is. Um, yeah. And then, like, that, that Arsenal team was very successful, um, competing in Europe as well, cup finals. What was it about them that made them so... So oh, we weren't successful for a good few years, you know, we, we put, Bertie and me put a lot of kids in and we were having a rough time and when you think now the pressure that's on managers, we, we, were, we were languishing down the, the bottom of the first division at 16th, 17th and, uh, you know, Bertie would still keep his job because he'd won the double in 71 and he, and he, was, he was trying to bring a new team through. So we struggled for a few years but when Don Howe came back on with Terry Neal in 1977-78, we began to get things going. Like I was obviously 20, 21 then, Stapleton was 20, O'Leary had been in the team since he was 17. Uh, you know, we were strong and uh, we had Pat Rice and Sammy Nelson and Terry bought Pat Jennings from Spurs. Uh, so we became a really strong team, particularly in the Cups. We couldn't, um, we couldn't match teams in the league. We just didn't have the squad. So Liverpool and Leeds and teams like that were, were, were stronger than us. But we became a very, very good cup side. And obviously the cup final of 79. Yeah. That's the memories of that day. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, there's three games uh, in, in my career that, you know, I can't separate. That's one of them. My debut for Ireland in 74 is the other one and winning the first title at Juventus in 1981 is the other one, so those, those three games. And we've already seen you, you were in the proper shirt at the end of the game, but you went home with a winner's medal, so fair play. Um, just on to Ireland then, 1974 was the Ireland debut. Yeah, well that was brilliant, you know, uh, I had set my sights once I got in the first team. That was a bad hair day, that day. <laughs> That, that was actually, uh, you know, it was, it, it was the fashion then to have your hair perm. And I was with a landlady, Mrs. Cranston was her name, living in Winchmore Hill in North London. And Mrs. Cranston said, oh, I used to work as a hairdresser. <laughs> I, I, I know how to perm your hair. Have a look at that. That was a bad, bad perm, wasn't it? <laughs> but there you go, uh, you know, that was, that was the hairdo on, on my debut, and uh, what a debut it was. Uh, we beat the Soviet Union 3-0. The Soviet Union was then, ironically, included countries like Ukraine and Georgia and these countries that are probably 
fighting against them now, but uh, they had an unbelievable side. They had Blocking, uh, who was the European Footballer of the Year, playing on the left wing, and uh, we beat them 3-0. That was my first game. Um, never forget it. Don Gibbons hat trick. Uh, brilliant performance from the Irish team. Johnny Giles was player manager. Uh, he was probably man of the match for me. Uh, but I had a very good debut and we got on well together in midfield. And I stayed there for a long time then. Right, I think we need to see a bit of this footage of that debut. But Giles was now the player manager and he picked a good team. He was very clever and knew what he needed. Uh, most of all, he had chosen a new midfielder who was to become one of the greatest ever. Long haired fellow with a bit of a loping style called Liam Brady. His first, this is Liam Brady, his first touch in senior international football. My claim to fame was I was dropped for the start of Liam Brady's international career, which of course we know was, was an absolutely brilliant one. But I mean, it's funny the way it turns out because uh, watching that game from the touchline, it was fabulous. Liam Brady showing his composure so early in the game. Did I remember you? after about 15 to 20 minutes, Gilesy, who was being man marked by a Russian player, saying, I'm going to play right back and let Brady run the show. Those were his words. He said, I'm going to play a fullback. And that guy followed him. And he just gave, he gave centre stage to Liam Brady, debut, in a huge game. Um, it was, he was magnificent that day. It was the best debut I've ever seen anywhere. Givens. Brady. Good effort by young Brady. I think we need a reaction to that, don't we? So, so great memories of the, that day, as you said. How did you find, obviously, playing with Giles and, and the, t the team at that time? What was our strengths and weaknesses? Well, John was a great manager. Um, Probably with Trapattoni, I would pick out as the, the best, best two coaches I had. Um, John could actually play in the team and also tell everybody around him exactly what he wanted. Very calm, uh, but also very positive. You know, I remember in the dressing room at 2-0, half time of that match, he said, right, we, we'll go and get the third and kill it off altogether. And let's not be nervous, let's not try and protect our lead, let's go for it. And that was his attitude all the time. And he was a great footballer. I liked, it, liked the, uh, the ball played out from the back, wanted the goalkeeper to throw it to the full backs. And uh, like, uh, way ahead of his time, you know. Uh, so I really enjoyed my time with, uh, with John, but uh, what did it last? About six years before he left in 1980, and I think on hand took over. Very unlucky, I think we were talking, talking to Declan, the former secretary down there, how many times we were hard done by, by referees uh, with decisions that went against us. I know VAR is a hugely contentious thing in, in football now, and it's, uh, it's got its critics, but honestly, when you see the, some of the decisions that we had back in the day, uh, I'm all for it because it run, rules out corruption from referees. And then when you came back then to your, well, Arsenal and stuff, your move then to Italy, that was like an amazing thing at the time really, wasn't it? That all the best players in the world were there. You were able to go there as one of the foreign players. Well, they weren't there at that time, um, uh, Martin, because it, it, Italy only opened up their, their football to foreign players in 1980. They got beat by North Korea in the 66 World Cup final, and they blamed that on the fact that there were too many foreign players in their league. So they stopped having foreign players from 1966, and they opened it up again in 1980. And I had played against Juventus in the semi final of the Cup Winners' Cup. Arsenal knocked them out. We beat them uh, on, on uh, we beat them 2 win, 2 1 on aggregate. And, um, they signed me, I think, on the back of that. Now, I don't think I was, I was first pick. I think they had uh, Kevin Keegan and maybe Platini and Rummenigge, but they couldn't get them at the time. So I was lucky to get the calls and I went, you know. I was sad to leave Arsenal, but when you'd grown up at Arsenal, they didn't really look after players that had grown up there. They, uh, 
they're inclined to think, oh, well, we've looked after you since you were a kid, so, you know, we don't need to look after you financially. And players were coming in, the likes of Malcolm McDonald and maybe Brian Talbot, and earning a lot more than myself and Frank Stapleton and David O'Leary. I left. Frank left the following year. He went to Manchester United. Arsenal fans forgave me because I went to Turin. Frank went to Manchester United. They never forgave him. <laughs> uh, and Dave O'Leary, well, he, 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 got, he got what he deserved, you know. He, he got what we should have got, you know. So uh, David had a, had a great career at Arsenal, didn't he? He's probably going to be one of the greatest Arsenal players. He's played 730-odd games for Arsenal. I don't think that will ever be beaten, you know. I, I don't think I'll ever see that beaten. Uh, so I went to Juventus, and that's Trapattoni on the right. Uh, the Irish Supporters Club will remember him fondly, I hope. Uh, you know, he, had, uh, he got us qualified for the Euros in 2012. We had that, we had that game in Paris uh, when Henri handled the ball. <laughs> VAR, if we had VAR, would he have got away with it? No chance. So that's why I'm all for VAR. But that's me arriving at Turin Airport. Didn't have to go through passport control or anything. Uh, I was carried shoulder high through the, through the terminal uh, into a press conference, and that was me joining Juventus. And then you settled in Italy quite well after a while. Yeah, I loved Italy. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, it was it was difficult, difficult enough to start with. The pressure was on. There was only one foreign player per team, so the focus of attention was on, especially at a club like Juventus, was a foreign player. So I remember my first league match was away at Cagliari in Sardinia. There'll be lots of Irish supporters who will remember Cagliari in Sardinia when. We drew with England in the 1990 World Cup and Kevin Sheedy equalised, remember that? Yeah. yeah. So that was my first game and it was really, really hot. It was September 1980 and I really didn't cope with the heat and uh, I didn't play very well. And uh, I heard one of the directors say that I think we've made a mistake with our foreign player. Uh, I could understand a bit of Italian at the time, but uh, it went on to prove him wrong. and I had a great season that year and uh, we won the league and that picture is when I scored a penalty in my second season that won us the league as well and that's the great Paolo Rossi uh, celebrating beside me who unfortunately passed away a year and a half ago. But the amazing thing about this is the final game isn't it and you've scored the winning penalty which we're going to show in a minute but you knew you were leaving. Uh, at this stage. Yeah, I'd been told three games from the end that uh, they were going to sign Platini and I was out and uh, it was something I couldn't understand. But then, you know, we had the owner was called Gianni Agnelli who was like a huge, huge business man in Italy, multi-billionaire, a bit like Abramovich at Chelsea. So what he wanted, he got, you know. And I think he always wanted Platini. So when he had the chance to get him, I had to make room, so yeah, I, I didn't quite understand the decision, and that's probably a bit of fuck you and that <laughs> in that punch. But uh, excuse me, boys and girls. Uh, uh, but yeah, you know, but you can see the joy on Rossi's face. He's happy for me. Right, let's see this penalty. Brady, pinta e gol. 1-0 per la Juventus è il trentesimo minuto. A 15 minuti dalla fine del campionato la coppia di testa si separa. La Juventus è passata in vantaggio. Calcio di rigore di Bredi alla mezz'ora. Abbiamo rivisto la finta e il gol di Bredi. I due stranieri tesserabili saranno per il prossimo campionato Platini e Boniek. Palese, Braglia... Lunghissimo il passaggio in profondità di Braglia, ma c'è anche il fischio dell'arbitro con un discreto anticipo. La Juventus vince per 1-0 a Catanzaro su calcio di rigore di Bredi al trentesimo della ripresa. Vince il campionato e aggiunge, dopo 20 scudetti, la sua seconda stella sulla maglia. Signore e signori, buonasera. I don't know if any of the audience have obviously watched um, Liam's brilliant documentary earlier this year, An Irish Man Abroad. 
Fantastic, and I know that you got the match ball some way from that match, and you gave it back to them recently, didn't you? I did, yeah. It was uh, lying in the house, uh, so I, I thought, well, you know, put it somewhere people are going to see it. So I brought it back to the museum at Juventus. Brilliant. You obviously embrace the Italian culture, and you could you have come home? In a sense, home. Yeah, home. I had a few phone calls from uh, uh, Terry Neal wanted me back. Yeah, uh, Ron Atkinson wanted me. Um, Brian Clough. <laughs> Phone rang and he said, "Hello there, do you know who this is, young man?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I've had two years in Italy and I, I like, you know, I liked it. So I went to Sampdoria then and I played with Trevor Francis and Roberto Mancini. I had two years there and then Inter Milan wanted me and. I went to there playing the San Siro, 70, 80,000 home games, um, Rummenigge, Altabelli, you know, great players, playing against great players. I played against Passarella, you remember Passarella, the Argentinian captain who won the World Cup in 78? And we had a bit of a run in the midfield. He was a hard man, he was a hard man. <laughs> and uh, he pushed me and he said, Inglesi di merda. <laughs> which means you English shit <laughs> and I said no 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 Irlandese <laughs> <laughs> man just to bring it right back around to modern day football then do you think you know we uh, Robbie Keane made the move to Italy do you think more of our players should kind of make that move well I don't know that was that was the best league probably at the time certainly by the time uh, I'd been there three or four years. It was the best league in the world. You know, they had the, all the all the superstars from, apart from who Real Madrid and Barcelona used to get. But uh, we had all the, you know, we the Italy had all the superstars. You know, so uh, I mentioned Passarella. We had Socrates. We had Zico. We had Boniek, Platini, uh, and of course the best of them all. And we, we had Zico as well, who were put very very near the top but we had the best of all in Diego Maradona at Napoli you know I played against him about six or seven times that was great memory and then eventually you did after moves around Italian clubs you did decide to, <coughs> to come back to well I had a bit of a nightmare at the last club I went to you know uh, uh, you know it's all in the book by the way <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to spoil it seriously <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't wait to get out of Ascoli after a few months because the guy said he was going to pay me X amount of pounds and it never materialised, so it was, it was a bad move. I went there because of money. It's the, it's the only time I went solely for money and uh, uh, I, I made a bad mistake. But West Ham re re rescued me. Any West Ham people? No? Good man, yeah. Uh, I love my time at West Ham, uh, great place to play, Upton Park, uh, as it was, uh, tremendous atmosphere, I really enjoyed my time there. And your last goal in football? Yeah, um, Billy Bonds was the manager then, and he said to me, I'm going to play in the last game of the season, there was nothing on it, it was against Wolves, and I said, no Billy, play a kid, give a kid uh, the chance. And hopefully we'll be winning. You can put me on with, you know, a few minutes from the end. And he did that about 15 minutes from the end. And right on the final whistle, I rifled the win in from about 25 yards. And the referee blew the final whistle. So I actually scored with my last kick in professional football. I think, you know what's going to happen now? Let's have a look at that goal. Perhaps the biggest cheer, though, is reserved for Liam Brady. The popular Irishman has decided to call it a day at the age of 34. Chairman Martin Kearns wishes him well at the end of his three years at West Ham. Brady. The fans would love to see him get on the score sheet. Let's fly. Oh, Great goal that was, amazing. 
I need a pause for that one. <laughs> okay, obviously we are here for the Irish Supporters Club, London. Um, so we're bringing it back around to Ireland now. An amazing crew, as we know. I'm just going to show some footage so some of our younger and our viewers here this evening can see how good Liam Brady was for Ireland. Giles with the free. Now it's Brady. Oh, beautifully played. He's in. Yes, Liam Brady. Stapleton, nice little ball played inside for Brady. Played back beautifully by him for Brady again. And it's in there. Off the keeper, but Brady's goal. Brady's touch there. The flick by Stapleton there. I think they're as full as now the Gary Bailey, the goalkeeper, I think. <laughs> so now, Liam Brady, who missed the penalty for Arsenal in the Cup Winners' Cup Final here in 1980. The penalty shootout against Valencia. Liam, don't do it this time. 2-2! The point is saved! Liam Brady brings out the flags. And 2-2 two -two is the score. Brady. Oh, Richard Berg. And now Brady again. Yes! Super build-up. And right on the half hour, a super goal. There you go, it's amazing. <laughs> and, the, and again, just reaching into my little memorabilia pile, that's the 87 match programme there. So, um, no price on that one either, but I don't think the FAI would have been giving them away for nothing, to be honest. So, um, but yeah, some amazing goals there, and it kind of brings us round to, obviously, Ireland, 88, 1990, the relationship with Jack. Well, Jack got the job in about 86, and uh, uh, that, our first European campaign was, uh, was going to be against Belgium, Scotland, Bulgaria, Luxembourg. Um, we had to top the group to qualify, uh, so Jack came in, I think his first match was against Wales in a friendly at Lansdowne, and uh, Jack laid down the law that he didn't want, he didn't want me looking, from, looking for the ball from the centre backs or the full backs, uh, the ball had to go long into the corners, we were going to chase it, and then if it came back to me I'd be further up the field and could take people on and things like that. So, Jack, that was Jack's philosophy. It wasn't my philosophy, so I knew I was going to have a few problems. And uh, the first game against Wales, I didn't play very well. So, we come Belgium, I think that was March. Uh, that was a friendly match. And then September was the start of our qualifying program. And I didn't expect to play. Um, but I was at Ascoli a couple of months. I was really, really fit. I was uh, in, in his best shape I've been. I trained very well. The day before the match, Jack picked the team. And uh, as I say, I wasn't expecting to play, but he said Bonner, Chris Uton, right back, number two, Jim Beglin, number three, Mick McCarthy, number four, Kevin Moran, number five. He pointed at me. And he said, Ian, you're number six. <laughs> Ray Houghton, Ray Houghton, number seven. And I put my hand up and he, he looked at me and he said, what is it? And I said, Ian Brady, Jack, was the Moore's murderer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there you go, you saw the goal, you saw the penalty in the last minute uh, to get us a great draw, to get us off to a, a really good start against Belgium who I think finished third in the World Cup the previous year, so uh, in 86, so away we went and that was the start of me playing all, I played all the games for Jack, all eight, and uh, didn't have a problem with him, played really well. Um, and qualified, didn't we? We beat Bulgaria 2-0 in the last game and I thought, I got sent off in the last minute and uh, I thought, well that's it now. I'm, I was 32 years of age and Jack, I knew, wanted to move on to other things and I thought, well, I've, at least I've done well. We've, 
we finished you know high up the group we've had a really good campaign uh, didn't expect Scotland to go to Sofia in Bulgaria and get a result but they did and all of a sudden you know I've got a four match ban for violent conduct and I'm not not, not going to be able to play in the in the in the finals in in Germany but we appealed it and I got it reduced to two and then a month later I ruptured my crucial ligament playing for West Ham and that was the end of that so I never got to play in the major championships by the time I come back Jack had moved on to other players and uh, the likes of Andy Townsend, Ronnie Wheel and Kevin Sheedy all great players uh, so he didn't really want me anymore and uh, he made it he made it plain to see when he substituted me against Germany after half an hour. So I'm in the dressing room at half half time. I called him a big ignorant bastard. <laughs> uh, but that was it. That was the only row we had, apart from playing cards. Play cards for money, and if Jack was losing, he'd throw the cards away, he'd throw them out the window or something like that. Uh, so. Um, that was it. That was it. I knew I, I knew it was over. Uh, I didn't think it should have ended that way, but there you go. That's that's football. But you did then go off to the World Cup as well, like punditry, didn't you? you did, yeah, you, you know, when one door video. closes, another door opens, and the BBC asked me to to be on their team to go to Italy '90. Then I did. Uh, good bit of work for the BBC in the interim years and then I went again with them in 94 for the World Cup. This is when I was still involved in football so it was, uh, that's the day of my testimonial. Uh, he even took me off that day as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was scared I was going to embarrass him so he took me off. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, and then I had a well, I had, a, I had a go at management, which wasn't successful. Uh, I had five years of that at Celtic and at Brighton. Um, then I went uh, into the Arsenal Academy as head of, head of youth, and I had nearly 20 years doing that. And whilst I was doing all that, I also had a, a career in, uh, in the TV. So look, looking back, I've had a wonderful time. Yeah, yeah, mate. Let's move on to the media then. I mean, an iconic group of pundits and presenters. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dumpy and you early on now? Well, he'd been very critical of me, you know, when uh, when it was the on hand years when we were unlucky to miss out on the first qualifying. As I mentioned, we were robbed, uh, particularly against Belgium and France. Uh, so Owen was very unlucky, and then we didn't do so well after that and then when that was when Eamon was trying to make a name for himself and I was the probably the 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 biggest target he could he could fire criticism at so when RTE asked me uh, to become a pundit on their panel I said there's no way I can work with Dunphy I'm sorry I can't do that. Uh, but they made me a very good financial offer <laughs> So I had to think again, and I rang, I rang Johnny there uh, beside me, and I said, John, what, you know, what do you reckon? I always rang John when I had a problem. If I had been on, what's that quiz? Uh, he would have been phone a friend. Uh, uh, um, so John said, well, you know, one thing you'll never be bored in Eamon's company, and uh, if you don't like it, you can always pack it in. So. I went and I stayed 25 years. <laughs> they sacked John and then they sacked Eamon and then they sacked me, all in that order. No, we were all getting on a bit, so you've got to know when it's time to go. I've known when it's time to go in my football career as a player. I knew when it was time to go when I wanted to finish at the academy and I knew when it was time to go doing the punditry stuff. The other guy in there is Bill O'Hurley, Cork man who was uh, a brilliant master of ceremonies and uh, there was never a dull moment, you know. 
Eamon, Eamon could make, uh, you know, could make, he could have a round and empty room, Eamon could. <laughs> I just want to bring you back to something then, as well, when you're playing Queer with Ireland. You, you mentioned earlier the controversy and stuff, and we'll come on and talk about Thierry Henry, you know, a legend to Arsenal fans, of course, but, you know, Irish fans, we probably don't feel the same. Um, but you, you mentioned controversies in Irish football. We want to show you some footage from the 1981 game, um, Ireland against Belgium. That's Ireland's goal, it's disallowed, isn't it? Yeah, that was just before half time, and uh, we kind of weathered the storm, they were very good, but um, we got the three kicks. And it's like, you can see from here, Frank is well on side. He's got two Belgian players go side of him. And then <laughs> they get he dives there, Garrett, and he gets a free kick on the edge of the box. And uh, they score from it. So the game was definitely bent and the referee was bent. And uh, that cost was qualifying for, for Spain in 82. So you can see why I'm all for bar, can't you? <laughs> I think it might have been a foul and shame of McDonough as well, but the referee was under orders for Belgium to win. And I think it came out subsequently that he was uh, a corrupt referee. Yeah, he was quite unlucky then, though, in hand. Yeah, that, that campaign he was, yeah, th th without doubt. And we, we kind of struggled struggled a bit in the next two campaigns and he lost his job and Jack came in. And then just to bring you forward then, 2009 when you, you came in with, with Trap um, and that infamous night in Paris. First of all, just tell us about your appointment with Trapatoni because you were kind of involved, weren't you, in, in getting Trapatoni into the Irish job? Well, it wasn't my suggestion. I got a call from Don Gibbons, who was the under-21 manager and was quite close to John Delaney. And he rang me and he said, look, Liam, we've, we've, we've had it from an agent that Trapattoni would, would be interested in taking the job. What do you think? I said, well, if you can get him, get him. And uh, he said, well, you ring him. Oh, so I rang him and he said, well, yeah, I'm kind of interested. I think he was wanted to take it easy playing with club football. He was he was in Salzburg, I think, um, and uh, he'd been uh, managing club teams most of his career. He managed Italy in the 2002 World Cup. Um, they got knocked out in the quarterfinals, I think, to South Korea. But uh, I think he wanted to take it easier, so. He said, well, come over and speak to me. And we went over, Don Gibbons and me, and we spoke to him. And uh, we weren't talking money or anything like that. He, he asked me what I thought. And I said, look, we have some very, very good players. I think if you and your organizational skills and your coaching skills, um, we could, we could do a very, you could do a very good job and we could, we could qualify. So that's exactly what he did. He came in, he got us organized. I know people were critical of his, this style of football he played and maybe the fact that he didn't pick, pick certain players. But he, he wanted us to be strong and, and hard to beat. And, you know, he always went for two strong men in midfield. And on the outside, he wanted wingers who would chase up and down. And that's how he picked his team, you know. So, and, you know, the first World Cup campaign, we, we didn't lose a match. Uh, and we finished second. And of course, we Blatter moved the goalposts again. It wasn't a free draw. It was going to be a free draw. Then he said it was seeded because France might have gone out. It's totally corrupt FIFA, and uh, we had to uh, we had to go and play France. And we lost at home one 0 in, in Dublin. And then we went and gave one of the best performances you could ever see on the trap in in Paris. We played France off the off the pitch uh, until the referee. Gave that incredible decision and not not blowing for a handball. 
Right, I think we're going to have a look at that night in Paris. And if uh, the Black Eyed Peas come on that DJ booth after, we won't be happy. Up with the cross that Scalacci can clear, but straight to Doyle. Will it land here for Lawrence? He won the header. Keane looking to get in here, and brave goalkeeping by Lawrence to come straight out. And back. Doyle has held that on. Keane looks to get in again here. Scalacci did well to hold him up. Lawrence with the cross. Doyle with a header. Just couldn't plant a decent enough head on the end of it. That's Everest's header, which is loose. Lawrence now Whelan. Diara coming in to close down the space. Andrews, Duff has been calling for it for a while and now gets it. And this time Kilban is forward in support to his left. Kilban angles it back through for Duff. Now can he keep it in and pull it across? He has Keane! They've done it! Game on! 1-0 Ireland! It's the equaliser on aggregate! It's the breakthrough they craved! Well, there's no doubt, Rob, that they deserved it. They've been excellent for half an hour. They've been knocking on the door, Kevin Doyle had a great opportunity, but it's that man, Robbie Keane. From which they could produce something, as Lawrence sweeps in a free kick, and a man was left spare at the back, John O'Shea. Lawrence. Tricky one for Whelan. Here's Lasana Diara, it's a stumble, Robbie Keane nicked it away from him and got caught and has stayed down. But the chance is on here for Damien Duff! It's saved by Loris. How crucial could that save be for the French? Increased of another Irish goal, which really would put the French under the cosh. Lawrence for sprawling it through, Keane! This is his chance! No, just carried it too wide. As we draw to the close of the first period of extra time, Maluda's kick in towards Scalacci and Henri's in there to follow it in and Gallas was there from close range and suddenly the French are back in control Show the replay yeah. <laughs> So obviously disappointing that night like, probably the most heartbreaking I've ever been in the stadium to be honest um, Did you ever speak to Thierry Henri about that? Yeah, well, I didn't realise he celebrated as, w as much as he did after the game, uh, or after the goal there, you know. Uh, uh, at the end of the game, he was, he was kind of coming around shrugging and saying, you know. And I thought, well, you know, in, in football, if you get away with a hand, the ball bounces awkwardly and you stick your hand out and the referee doesn't see it. Um, well, you get away with it, so part and parcel of the game. But I didn't realise until you showed me that now how wildly he celebrated I think that was out of order to be going on perhaps something I would have I would have gone walk back and said nothing yeah I look forward to you taking that up with him at the Emirates when you next see him please <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so just to bring it back round to kind of modern day Ireland you, you stepped back away then from the, the the islands kind of set up then trap got us to Euro 2012 a brilliant achievement ultimately but you know, how did you find it at that time? Well, there was only 16 teams then, you know, so when Jack got us there, it was only eight. So you, how difficult is that in, in the standard of European football? And when Trapp got us there, I think it was uh, 16 teams. And, uh, you know, he got through, he got it, he, he did it through a playoff, but we won the playoff very, very well. Look, we, we played, uh, I think we played Croatia, Spain and Italy. and. Three, three of those teams got to the semi-finals, you know, yeah. uh, two in the final, obviously. Uh, we were up against it, so um, I think, the, I think the, the, the media in Ireland turned again. So I don't, I don't think they liked the fact that he was from Italy and he was managing Ireland. I, I think they felt there was a bit something a bit mercenary about it, but there you go. You can't please all the people all of the time, but uh, um, they got... the. He went, so, you know, we know the history since then. Martin O'Neill, again, got us to uh, um, uh, a Euros. Uh, we haven't been to the World Cup since 2002, I don't think, have we? No. no. Um, so, uh, we're struggling a bit at the moment, but, uh, you know, 
is a new, new manager going to come in? He's got a young team. Uh, and with a bit of organisation, a bit like Trapp did in, uh, in his initial time with us, uh, we might be able to turn things around and make a better fist of what we've been doing in the last few years. And just on Patty Bonner being involved now at, with the FAI at kind of director's level, have you not ever been approached by the FAI kind of that advisory role, like bringing your experience to it or recommend a, recommending a manager or anything like that? No, no. Nothing at all. So I know during the week you kind of were at the, the, the awards and you, it kind of went a bit viral, didn't it, in this modern day language, when you mentioned about Brian Kerr coming back. Yeah, I said it to Declan and we're having a chat down there, having a drink. You know, I don't want to see uh, some of the candidates get the job. I'd rather, uh, if we can't get Lee Carsley, who's obviously an up-and-coming manager, uh, he's done very well with the England under-21s, he's an Irish international, he knows what playing for Ireland means. If we can't get him, and the fact that we haven't already got him, I, I think means that he's probably not going to come. So. Uh, I'd, you know, some of the candidates uh, I'd rather not have and uh, I think Brian Kerr would do a very good job. I know he's in his 70s now but that, you know, look at Roy Hodgson last season at Palace. I think that doesn't mean anything, age doesn't mean anything. And he could bring in a couple of young lads with him. Maybe Damien Duff who's doing a very good job in the League of Ireland with Shelburne. Uh, and, and take it from there. Um, I think he's a safe pair of hands. Yeah. Do, do you think it is an attractive job, though, as well? Like, you know, I know we've had Stephen Kenny's tenure brought through a lot of players. He's obviously self-proclaimed that, hasn't he, and circumstances dictated it. But do you think it is an attractive job? Have we got the players? Uh, no, I don't think we have the players, but we could have the players. I think things are, are getting better. Uh, they probably need uh, a bit more experience, but... Um, I think there's a, a panel there to work with for a, for a manager who get them organised. And let's face it, we've been out of qualifying groups before they're even started. Two or three games in, you know our fate. So that has to change. And unless you get somebody in who has that organisational skill, it probably won't change. You need somebody who's good with young players. And Brian Kerr has proved that. So I, I doubt very much if Brian will get it. Uh, especially if I've recommended it, but uh, we shall see. I like also like Chris Uden. I like Chris. Chris is a no, but well, Chris is a former Irish international. I think he's another safe pair of hands. He's very organisational. So, um, who? Anthony Barry, who is with. Um, well, I don't know Kevin. anything about him. All he's been is a coach. You know, I don't know anything about him. So just to open up to the floor now, we've got a few minutes left of the kind of the interview and Q and A. Um, if you can shout loudly, we'll pick up a few questions. Very conscious as well. After this, we have to sell raffle tickets to you, so don't rush off. You'll be able to buy the books at the back of the, the room as well, and then in an orderly fashion, we'll come up and we'll give, obviously leave a bit of a break, and then we'll do the book signing. Um, but there's some fantastic raffle prizes, as I've said. We've also got didn't mention it there. We've got the '79 Cup final still. Upsets me seeing that last minute goal going in. But we've got that program there in frames as well, so we'll get that signed and some fantastic things. And it's all in aid of the North London Hobbs, as I said. So we'll open up. Damien? Quick question on, on, on the fiasco that was Trinidad and Tobago. You, play, you played that game. Do we play the international team or do we play a bunch of waiters in the first game? And was there two games played? That... I don't honestly know. <laughs> you were involved. Yeah, but I don't honestly know. It was a typical uh, farcical FAI tour, you know. We went to Brazil uh, via Argentina, and the UK was at war with Argentina, and they took us via Buenos Aires. Uh, and we had lads in detention centers for 10 hours, you know, being grilled about why they had UK passports. Um, it was a farcical tour. We didn't have a team. We got beat 7-0 by Brazil. Uh, we actually didn't play badly in the first match. And then they threw in Trinidad and Tobago to finish. So I scored, and it's down as an international goal. So I'm keeping it. Yeah, get the ball. Hi, Liam. 
Hello. Great to speak to another United fan. Uh, just a quick one. Like you've had an amazing career. I just wondered, was there any ever any regrets not winning a uh, All Ireland of Dublin? Uh, uh, regret what? Not winning an All Ireland. No, no, no. I was there for plenty of our wins. Don't worry about that. So. Uh, no, uh, uh, I think I left that to Kevin Moran, you know. Another question there. Who's your favourite League of Ireland team? Uh, Shelburne. <laughs> yeah, Shelburne, because they used to play at Tolka Park yeah. uh, and alternate with Drumcondra. And I was only I was only a 15 minute walk from Tolka Park, so I used to go and watch shells. I thought you would have said balls. No, no, I'm sorry, no, no. Yeah, well that's good to see, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think League of Ireland's on the up, as I said at the start of the night, yeah, yeah. All right, well, another question there. So Liam, who was your favourite player to play alongside club and club? My favourite player to play alongside, oh, there's a few candidates. I remember playing with Alan Ball at Arsenal when I was a young, a young player. Uh, he was a World Cup winner for England in 66. He was a great player. Uh, and then, you know. Why did you like it? Why did you like it? Is it because they're nice or because they're skills? Both. Yeah, <laughs> both. Yeah. He used to take me to uh, horse racing meetings okay. and uh, <laughs> nightclubs. <laughs> and nightclubs, and he was a brilliant footballer as well. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, Karl Heinz Rummenigge played for Inter Milan. He was one of my favorite players to play with. Probably the most favorite, because he's a big mate of mine, is Marco Tardelli, who scored that goal in the 1982 World Cup when the celebration is, is uh, iconic. Well, that again, I'll, I'll come in here. The Irishman abroad, so you he blames you for bringing them on the beer quite a bit as well, though, doesn't he? No, they, the Italians <laughs> didn't drink. I like, you know, I always like to drink, still do. Uh, but uh, when I went to Italy, my drinking days ended because I didn't have anybody to go with. None of them drank. Yeah, question there, Debar. Shout up. Some years ago, you myself had some great games with Darius down in the Queen's Head, Winsport Hill. I remember that well, yeah. That was a big tournament on tomorrow. Yes, I know. I think I met the, the, our, our representative, our Irish player's wife is here tonight. She was there on the left anyway. Who would, you like, who would you like to take on? Well, I don't follow it that much, so, you know, I don't follow it that much. I was only in the Queen's Head playing darts so I could drink. Yeah. You, were good. you weren't good in your day. I don't think so. No, I don't oh, think you were. Yeah. I took a couple of bob off. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that wouldn't be hard. That's hard. And where about? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, we've got to just show this quick photo here. We've got Paul Boyle here this evening, one of our infamous members of our club. That's a photo of you in Brussels in '81. Looking well there. He brought that photo along tonight. Um, yeah, that's when we both had hair. Yeah. <laughs> now, just to give Paul a shout out, Paul is one of our very few Ireland fans. I think he's been at every Irish tournament that Ireland have ever competed in. Yeah, that's that's amazing. <laughs> that, that, last, last question from the Arsenal supporter. <laughs> what are your thoughts on Arsenal this year? Uh, what are my thoughts on Arsenal this year? I think we'll give it a go. Yeah, we'll give it a go if we could, uh, if we could kind of get Jesus scoring a few more goals. You know, we need a kind of out and out goal scorer. We we seem to be getting goals from uh, Odegaard and 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 Saka and Martinelli, but I think we need somebody's going to knock it in twenty goals a year. But I think we'll give it a good go. Last last one to the lady. So. Is your favourite um, team Arsenal still? My favourite team is Arsenal, yeah. 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 I, I, went there, I went there as a boy and they, they made me into a football player, so I owe them an awful lot. And when I finish, can I say, it's an honour to be your president, okay? And, uh, you know, I'll come, I'll come to your evening at the Irish Centre if I'm around. Uh, so, 
thanks for the reception here tonight. It's been really warm and really loving, and uh, I have a great time. Thank you very much. Have a big hand, please, for Liam Brady. Yeah, okay, it's fine. Liam, yeah. we, we had a few doubts. Come on in, raise your hands. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh no, I couldn't give them your fucking privilege. Come on! Congratulations on your career. Fantastic. Give Bowie note there. Best wishes. Hi. Can you sign these as well, my darling? Um, Whereabouts in Dundagall are you from? Uh, from uh, Glen Column Kill, which is out past Killybegs. Okay.